and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by the man I think of as the general manager of the Total Soccer Show. His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello, mini American flags for all. That's my number one <laughs> campaign policy. <laughs> Great, I love yep. that. Um, so today we have listener questions. Um, I was going to say how many, but I realised that my count is not always accurate. So let's just say more than a handful. Six, I believe. Okay, let's say six. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so should we get straight into it? Sure. Okay, because it's kind of newsy, the first mm-hmm. one. Um, first question comes from Barry Elmore. Barry says, he sent us the link to the uh, the Jeff Carlisle article about US soccer possibly creating a new GM position. Um, he says, have you seen this Jeff Carlisle story? Yes is the answer. Indeed. Um, then he says, this feels very fishy to me in the light of incoming presidential change. Is there a chance the board and Gulati is trying to dilute the new president's power and retain theirs? Right. So should we explain what's happened first? Sure. So basic, I guess the basic idea would be that in the past, the uh, president of U.S. soccer has sort of, when it's been Sunil Gulati at least, has sort of acted as like the person in charge. Mm-hmm. So they've made all the decisions in terms of hiring and firing kind the coaches. Kind of Jefe. Yes, and a lot of other kind of overarching decisions. Yeah. So it's the supposed idea. to be that the mm-hmm. board uh, d- unanimously decide uh, yeah. or decide on the U.S. men's national team, U.S. women's national team head coach, mm-hmm. but it, and then the chairman of the board kind of, the, mm-hmm. the president kind of approves it or guides the process. But it's really been so far, Sunil Galati decides and he just like makes everyone agree with him. Yeah, I feel like it's, it's it. akin. This is what I always go to when it comes to boardrooms to uh, The Dark Knight uh, <laughs> <laughs> or Batman Begins, I guess, when it's like if Bruce Wayne says, Wayne Enterprises is going to do something the board is like yep that sounds good (laughs) like that's how that works so I think that's how it's been the idea here would be that instead of that it would be sort of the president is the director of the board but is sort of in charge of like making sure the board is doing what the board needs to be doing Mm -hmm. and then there'd be a general manager who'd be sort of responsible for running the actual soccer operations and making those types of decisions and it seems would be in charge of hiring the national team coach Mm -hmm. and then sort of helping with them right and you equated this to what Germany have right with Oliver Bierhoff yeah so Oliver Bierhoff is the manager of the German national team Jogi Löw is of course the the head coach and Oliver Bierhoff does things like I think as I understand it I read Das Reboot a while back it was his decision like where Germany's team would be based in Brazil Mm -hmm. they went to Manaus this thing where you had to like go down the river and they had this like private sort of facility built where no one could get to them I gotta say it sounds like the beginning to a bad side Sci-fi movie. Like, and then <laughs> right, on the yeah. way, they're attacked by a giant like boa constrictor. <laughs> well, all kinds of uh, things attack them, like Brazilians and well, all sorts, but they, <laughs> they fended them all off. They did. They did. <laughs> um, so yeah, it would be that kind of Dino position. Shark. And so just to go back to Jeff Carlisle's story, essentially, this was around the time of MLS Cup, right, which was earlier this month. There was a public US soccer meeting, which people could attend and see various things. And there was a sort of more not off the record, but private sort of executive meeting. And apparently someone leaked to Jeff Carlisle Mm. because it was just like sources tell me um, that there was discussion about creating this GM role and that it could be put in place before the next US soccer president um, is decided. And I want to like roughly explain what the conversation was in studio and then we're going to recreate it. It was essentially me reacting to Barry's uh, email, Daryl saying a thing and then me saying, oh. And my (laughs) reaction was... This doesn't feel so fishy to me because it's like, no, they're just creating a new position where you have somebody who sort of is overseeing what U.S. soccer Mm -hmm. is doing, uh, undecided whether it will be like a a director for the men's and then a director for the women's or if it will be one person in charge of both. But it seemed to me like a a logical idea. A lot of people have called for this as well to back up your ideas that a lot of people think this is a good way to separate out the powers of U.S. soccer. But then you made the point that... Oh, the doing it before the election Mm -hmm. kind of reduces the um, or gives cover to uh, candidates like uh, Carlos Cordero Mm -hmm. and Kathy Carter who are sort of business people first and soccer people either not at all or a distant second. Kathy Carter played soccer, I believe. And that's where I said, oh, because the yep. idea then is that like one of the weaknesses in their platform, those those two, as well as a couple other candidates, that like they don't have much background in terms of like soccer development, developing players, how to build a team, how to build yeah. a roster, how to well, not build a roster, obviously that's not their job, but those sort of like important decisions when it comes to governing soccer, if they don't have to deal with those anymore, suddenly a huge vulnerability in their platform is mm-hmm. no longer a vulner- vulnerability. Yep. And then by virtue of that, it weakens the candidacy of, say, Carl Martino mm-hmm. and Eric Quinalda yep. because they're running as soccer people. And now it looks like they're more suited in many ways mm-hmm. to, or you could make the argument that they're more suited to the GM role than the president role. Yep. Right? Or and, at least and, it, like, it's not as important to get them in the president role yeah. because they'll be this GM. And if you want to go like the semi-conspiracy route or like the something seems fishy route, like the, the idea would be that like my reaction, I think both of our reaction was sort of like, 
oh, but like Eric Ronaldo would be a good GM. Kyle yeah. Martino would be a good GM. And that maybe is kind of the idea that you're then like, oh, well then, yeah, Kathy Carter would be a good president and maybe a, a soccer player should be the uh, GM and suddenly... That's like entering a presidential primary and being told, oh, you'd be a good vice president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, We're at the first debate. <laughs> Ira is six months away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I... I uh, credit to Barry then, because I, I at first was just like, ah, oh, no, this just seems like a normal thing. And now mm-hmm. I am sort of like, it is a little strange that they're making these sort of moves to maybe, maybe possibly weaken the, not necessarily credibility, but the like strength of the, the candidacy of certain, uh, yeah, certain candidates. Yeah. So this is a weird thing. I think this is a kind of a things can be two things yep. situation where I would be happier with this structure, mm-hmm. right? I like the idea of a president and also a GM, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it worked, definitely worked for Germany. Yep. Um, but I don't like the timing of it because it seems to be that they're going to do this in order to bolster the candidacy of the business first candidate. I agree, especially because I don't see how they could possibly create this position before the actual election. Because, I mean, they that could. Was, that was in Jeff Carlos' story that it was going to be voted through maybe sort of uh, late January or yeah. February, I mean, I th- they could definitely like establish the position, but I can't see them filling it. And I can't mm-hmm. see them, that person then having the authority to hire a new head coach for the men's team. So it just feels like, with that in mind, this couldn't really like a lot of those actual changes couldn't be put in place until after February. So then it does feel like it is sort of just being there as, hey, we're going to change some stuff and run mm-hmm. it like an actual soccer club. Isn't that strange? Like mm-hmm. I saw that quote and was sort of like, huh, that seems weird. Um, I would also say that even though I'm in favor of this, I would prefer. So whatever the situation, I prefer the new president be mm-hmm. the one to institute this. Right? Absolutely. Because you would prefer the new president to sort of have some decision making about how this all goes down. Absolutely. Yeah. Then you get into the idea of like uh, further conspiracies of like, are you going to see? You love a conspiracy, don't you? Not, not always, not always. But I've been listening to more well, and more you podcasts love to that have them in there. That sense. Uh, yes, uh, last pad, last podcast on the left is great for that. Okay, um, but it's like the subtle conspiracies uh, as opposed to the giant ones. Like the mood is made of cheese. <laughs> um, but the idea that like you could maybe see two candidates like kind of come together and like, for example. Not really, really not using these two for any specific reason, but like Kyle Martino and Kathy Carter, they could sort of like if they had divided voter blocks could be like, hey, I'll be the GM. You be the president. We both have authority in the areas we want. We'll throw our votes together. Kathy Carter, you become president and then you like uh, nominate me and support me for GM. President GM becomes the equivalent of president VP on the ticket. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And that's it. That's all wild speculation. Wild speculation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Not quite moon is made of cheese speculation, but how many times should I say allegedly? Is that, does that help? Does that cover us? (laughs) I think we're good. I think we covered it. Yep. All right. So obviously as with all things, us soccer, we'll keep an eye on that story. I don't want to brag, but like I helped my wife study for like one law school exam for like 10 (laughs) minutes. And I feel like that means I'm qualified to say that allegedly covers us. We're good. We're good. (laughs) Did you sort of like, Get a headache and walk away from it? Uh, Almost instantly. (laughs) That's what I do. That's what I do. Um, Next question Mm -hmm. comes from Jonathan Holmgren. Jonathan wants to know, is there a pro-rail discussion or movement in Australia? Mm -hmm. If so, are there any parallels to the discussion slash movement in the United States? The answer is yes and yes. Well, I was going to give the answer of if (laughs) if you are the Australian – all right. I'm going to be the Australian uh, Federation. Ask me that question. Um, is there a pro-rail discussion no. or movement <laughs> in Australia? <laughs> and now for lots of other people, I'll say yes. <laughs> that's basically how it is right now. So obviously there is, for those who don't know, obviously Jonathan knows because that's mm-hmm. why he's asking this question. Australia has the A-League, which is the equivalent of Major League Soccer. It's kind of a single entity, or at least there's no pathway into right. it other than expansion right now. And we did some research. We found the only three soccer systems yep. that don't have pro-rail are the USA, Australia, Australia. And India, mm-hmm. the Indian Super League, yep. has no sort of promotion relegation. Yep. All right. But there is a new second tier league coming to Australia. It was recently announced, right? It was announced like early November. They're going to, they're trying to launch in 2019. Um, the Association of Australian Football Clubs will announce a thing called the Championship, which will be a second tier division under the A League. And they say that they want to then push towards promotion relegation. Yeah. But I'm not sure how the A League feel about it. Uh, I don't think they're they're <laughs> hugely in favor, but I think the reality of the situation is, and this is like the brief overview from reading a few articles, not trying to claim I'm an expert, but I imagine there are people out there who think, well, things don't really need to change in Australia. They're going to the World Cup again. They've qualified mm-hmm. again. They're only just going to the World well, Cup. Well, that's there, right? the difference, right? It's like, I mean, and keep that in mind, not just talking about having to uh, 
playoff against Honduras, but mm-hmm. there's also the issue of like they barely beat Syria in that, or like they barely got past Syria, that mm-hmm. is. And there's lots of issues. Tim Cahill was like all important in that team qualifying for the World Cup. He's 38. Mm-hmm. There's only 10 teams in the, the A-League. Yet. <laughs> no, but when that's like your key player, yeah, yeah. there are questions. There's only 10 teams in the A-League. There's a bottleneck in terms of youth development because yeah, yeah. there's not as many minutes for young players. So it is actually not a very rosy situation in Australia, which is why there is more movement towards establishing that second division, establishing relegation promotion, getting more teams involved. And the reason you said that is it Football Federation Australia um, like that, yeah. would say no and the A-League would say no is mm. that it's not like this is a designed plan where they've all agreed, yeah, we need a second tier and then mm-hmm. in five years we're yep. going to have pro-rel. This is more that this, like, I want to call it an upstart mm-hmm. league, has yeah. said, we're going to start up in 2019, we're going to be the second tier and then we hope that leads to pro-rel. So yeah. they're, they're essentially trying to force the issue. Yep. And as I understand it, the, in terms of like parallels with the United States, as I understand it right now, what Australia has is the A-League, which is obviously a national league, mm-hmm. and then all the other leagues seem to be regional. As in, this second tier would be the yeah. first version of a national second tier. Everything else has been like in Queensland or Tasmania, I'm trying to name Australian states slash provinces. I, and I feel like I, I should... New South Wales. I feel like I should just go on record and say that with this question and the research that went into it came after we came up with our ideas for promotion relegation for the United yeah, yeah. States. Because, <laughs> yeah, to your point that like the conferences based on geography does seem a little bit like oh, what I was talking yeah, yeah. about. The idea there, though, is that they don't already have relegation promotion. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it it's is... It's called the National Premier League, right? And I think right? there's 93 teams yep. in there because yep. you have them all like spread across the entire country. Mm-hmm. And right now... Sort they, of, they in they as play, much as things are spread across Australia. And right now they play soccer in their sort of local... Uh, is it a state in Australia? I feel really embarrassed. Yes, it I is. Don't know. It is. Um, they play soccer within that sort of conference or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then there's no path... State leagues. Is state leagues. Yeah, there's them. no path to the A-League from that other than sort of doing the equivalent of the... The, the Don Don Revolution dance yep. where you have to prove mm-hmm. to the A-League that you're the team that should get yep. expansion. This would establish an actual second tier and they're trying to push the idea of Pro-Rail. Here's where I think this has a parallel but not a parallel to mm-hmm. the United States. The United States has never had a league that was set up under MLS to say, we are the second division and we want Pro-Rail to happen in the future. We're going to help to make that happen. And it had sort of almost the backing of all the all the smaller teams. Right? It didn't have 93 teams. I'm thinking mm-hmm. of NASL. When they were set up, they essentially said, we want to be an alternative to Major League mm-hmm. Soccer, right? We want to be a D1 league. And they've never had... Because USL was always yeah. there as well, it's never been a united front of all the other teams. Oh, I right? see what you're saying. Yeah, because I, I would say like maybe USL has been like that, but even then, you don't but have. They're happy to operate under exactly. MLS, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. You don't have that sort of agitation. And I mm-hmm. think another key difference, maybe, is that. As I said, like from everything I've read is that like attendance numbers are flatlining, TV in ratings are not doing very well in the A-League, whereas you now have these... I honestly think they're one good World Cup run away from getting those things back. That is right? the way... That's what happens in the US. Yeah. It picks up. If the if Australia go to the quarterfinals or this round of 16, mm-hmm. have a couple of exciting games, I think A-League attendance, even as it is, would tick up, at least in the short term. I think that's probably true, but I think it is sort of the case that then a lot of the talent on that team is either like Tim Cahill returning mm-hmm. or it's maybe He's a couple young a players. Right now, by the way. There we go. Yeah. Or it's a couple young players like and maybe middle-aged players playing at like the larger clubs and then a lot playing abroad. Mm-hmm. So you still don't have that you sort of... You know middle-aged means like 50, right? You're, I'm term, in terms of <laughs> soccer career, put it that way. Um, what I mean to say is just that you don't have as much maybe like even if you have Australia make a run when people are like, oh, I can't wait to watch two of those guys play <laughs> and I think that there is an idea that like if you have 93 teams suddenly incorporated into the second division with relegation well, promotion you bring with that a little bit more attention from around the country we do need to look at the details this second tier won't have 93 teams in it it'll be like a separate rung of the very biggest teams to go in that championship I don't know I like 93 teams <laughs> it's but, everybody home and away and the season never ends <laughs> and there's no like firm details on this mm-hmm. yet I don't think they're just planning to launch in 2019 yep. here's the thing that really interests me though is this if this happens this will would make Australia the latest in like a few countries mm-hmm. who didn't have pro rel in their soccer but have moved towards it. I mean, I did some quick research on the K League and the J League because what I read about Australia referred to those because they're also Asian uh, Federation, Asian Confederation mm-hmm. uh, leagues that have made this switch, right? The J League did it in roundabout two. It's confusing when it's AFC, right? Because yeah. you never know if the F is for football or federation. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Asian Federation Confederation. That, yes. I think that yep. is what it is. Yep. Um, so you <laughs> never know if. Uh, I'm so, oh, sorry, I was repeating what you said. Um, <laughs> the J-League did this around 2000. The K-League did it in 2013. Mm-hmm. It said they sort of had this single entity thing. 2011, they were like, we should change this. Two years later, 
They started the K League Challenge, I believe is what it called, and they started to have pro rail. Mm-hmm. So it can be done, and countries are doing it. It's and very limited, right? That it's like the last place team plays the top team. No, in the for, for the first season, it okay. was a playoff between bottom of the K League and top of the K League Challenge. The season after that, it was straight up to bottom goes down, top goes up, and then it's expanded there from there. Now mm-hmm. it's more go up and down. So yep. they really eased into it, but it it wasn't as complicated as it seems. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that's the thing that I'm seeing from other countries is that it's not actually as hard as people say it is. I agreed. Um, final point then, unless you have more to say, is just... No, no. The I reason- mean, I've always got more to say, but I hold it back. I think the reason why I was <laughs> mentioning like the 93 teams that could theoretically be involved is because we did have a couple people uh, in regards to our promotion relegation yeah. show saying... December 14th, if you want to find it, we're, we're quite... Quite proud of it, I think. I think we did a good job. It got a good reaction. So I would encourage you to go listen to it. If I you feel like already. you said quite proud and then weren't sure how I felt about it. So you tried to back <laughs> up. I'm quite proud. I didn't want, I wanted, didn't want to sound too immodest. That's fine. <laughs> um, but like we had some people say, like, but you guys didn't quite make the case for why you need promotion mm. relegation. And one of the arguments I would say is that the more – People, I personally speaking, that's all I can do. I will say that if the Richmond Kickers, our local team, had the even the slightest chance that like a solid season means they're in like a position where they could get promoted, I think I'm definitely going to show up to every single game and be that much louder. I think yeah. a lot more, and not just for my commentary <laughs> role, but you know, as a fan, I'll just but, reach over and turn your volume down. But I think a lot of people would, <laughs> and you can imagine that situation when like here's this team that's been there would for be forever. On the line. Yeah, things would be on the line. And so now imagine that for 93 teams that otherwise feel like they're disenfranchised, and the fan bases that come with them, and you start to understand how if every fan now for those like lower league teams is like, but maybe there's a chance it makes you want to turn up. And like even if that's not the case for say England. Like, I think there aren't teams in, like, the seventh tier who are like, but one day we'll be in the Premier League. But that's, I would say, because they're used to relegation But one promotion. day they could be in the sixth tier, mm-hmm. and one day they could be in the fifth tier, and yeah. that is exciting in and of itself. That is true. But I'm so saying, but are, even for those clubs, though, that they've been in that system for long enough that they're used to it, I do think that if it's a new system, even if you are the seventh tier in Australia now, it's still like, but there's a chance now, and there yeah. never was before. Mm-hmm. I 100% agree with that. I also think just it would increase interest in local soccer, yeah. not necessarily for Financially, although we hope that would be something in the long run. But just in terms of the excitement of lower league soccer, because it has this sort of bigger horizon. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where a stronger soccer culture comes from, from the bottom up, instead of, which does happen, like we talked about with Australia and with the US, interest peaks after the World Cup because people see the US and the interest trickles down from the mm-hmm. top. It would be good if that could start locally at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. All right. Like so we don't want to get back into Pro World, but please go find our show uh, from December 14th. Yes. And while you all do that, hopefully after this show, yeah. I'll move us on to the next question from Ethan Fletcher. Okay. How about instead of awarding players who convert penalty shots with a full goal, they are instead awarded a half goal with the other <laughs> half going to the person who actually drew the penalty? It's always bothered me that the players who are designated penalty kick takers get to pad their season goal tallies. Agreed. Occasionally at the expense of the players that actually created the opportunity. Double agreed. And if the player creates the penalty and also converts it, hey, then they're awarded the whole goal. Why not? Not. This is obviously just for statistical purposes, not for the actual scores in games. Uh, so do you remember my – I've always been of the opinion that uh, the player who wins the penalty should mm-hmm. have to take the penalty, yep. kind of like in an NBA free throw. We're not going back to this. Type d- okay, we won't <laughs> go back to that. But the reason the reason I wanted that is yeah. for the same reason as Ethan, mm-hmm. which is that when you see people's goal tallies, um, you then have to kind of extract – not extrapolate. You sort of have to um, extract – the number that a penalty kicks to really feel like how many they actually scored from open play. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this idea, I actually, I think it would be too weird to see someone score 21.5 goals for a season because some of them were penalty kicks. Yeah. Uh, But I do like the idea of the the penalty kick winner getting half the credit and the penalty kick taker getting half the credit. Okay. So I think I'm in for it, but I also am aware it won't happen. I like the idea. It won't happen. Yeah. But (laughs) I like the idea of, and we've talked about this before, about the person who gets who draws the penalty should at very least get the actual assist because if you look on the score sheet, yeah, did pen- not? No, it's just oh, a pe- wow. penalty is unassisted, and it does seem like the person who gets the penalty gets that assist. I would extend that to even if it's not converted, <laughs> they should statistically be credited with an assist because they did the work to well, make that they happen. Assisted. They've assisted a save. Yeah, why not? <laughs> they still get an assist. I don't care. But I think then the counterpoint to that, which is the fair counterpoint, is that maybe that incentivizes diving a little bit True. because then there is like a little bit more in terms of a personal interest as well as a team interest. If there's an assist bonus on the line. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, you never know, man. You never know. I would – so what we're both saying is we would be in favor of the penalty kick winner getting more credit for what ends up being the goal. Yes, yes. I wonder who would lead the category. Penalty kick winner? Yeah, I don't think it's a – it's it's a stat that I can't find on, say, who scored or anywhere like that. There's no penalty kicks one stat. I bet it's out there, and I bet it's a Man City player. (laughs) Oh, just because they've scored so many goals. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) 
That's yes. probably true. Yes. Kevin De Bruyne maybe might be up there. David Silva might be up there. Raheem Sterling maybe. Raheem Sterling maybe. Uh, he, he may be. Uh, it, I, I, bet, I bet that stat without. is out there, and I bet it's somebody surprising. Okay, there we go. Oh, okay, we'll try and look mm-hmm. that up after the show. I really wish sometimes we could stop the show and do research in the middle, and like just leave like a silence and but no, come back. Because that no. would be cheating. <laughs> okay. Thank you to Ethan for the question. Yeah, I was very close to continuing that sentence, but in like a wildly different cadence. So it absolutely sounded like we stopped, but we can just keep going. Next question comes from Nick Lawyer. Uh, Nick says, hi, guys. Like most soccer fans, I've been thinking about how to help U.S. soccer get better. I'm a coach and president for a very small club of about 150 players located in Western Montana. I feel like Nick's doing a lot of work not to tell us the name of the club. (laughs) I also represent the Classic League on the Montana Youth Soccer Association board. Um, He doesn't say shout out to Travis Clark, but I feel like there's the subtext there of shout out to Travis Clark (laughs) and a fist wave. Um, Nick says, I think a lot of small... fist wave? (laughs) I think a lot of small clubs in Montana do a great job at providing recreational and competitive experiences in the fall and spring. Lately, my local club, again, unnamed, I understand why, mm-hmm. has been focusing on the process behind our program. Defining a, play, defining a style of play, setting coach expectations, building a skill matrix, etc. Mm-hmm. This leads me to my question for you two. If you two could pick three things that every club, I assume youth soccer club, mm-hmm. should do well – what would they be and why? And I wonder if a list of best practices that can be clearly defined and measured might help clubs like us to get better. Mm-hmm. Before I turn this over to you, Taylor, it's yeah. worth adding, you do some, you, a lot of youth soccer coaching. Mm-hmm. I do not, right? I don't yeah. have any experience with youth soccer coaching, either being in it in the United States or doing it. So I'm going to sort of just caveat all this by saying that you know some stuff and I, all my stuff is theoretical. And I would say I know some stuff, but like, the thing with, with soccer coaching, like I, I coach really little kids right now. Uh, in the past, I coached kids at the more competitive age group. But like things are always changing. And mm-hmm. so like I know like when I first started coaching like U10s, U11s, like I would have them do like static stretching. And then that became this whole thing of like that's the worst thing. It has to be dynamic stretching. You mm-hmm. don't just run and then stretch. You have to – and like so there's always things that are evolving. And that kind of bleeds into my answer because for me – I don't feel as confident saying, like, you should be doing this technically because that's yeah. how you build a good player. One thing – so I, I don't like it normally when people caveat their answers so heavily, but mm-hmm. I do feel like we get a lot of questions asking us for kind of our advice about youth mm-hmm. soccer, and I'm really worried that people will take our advice too seriously and implement it, and we might be to blame for some kids having their sort of soccer yeah. careers ruined. It's like, so- win all the headers, <laughs> even though it's not allowed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what I would say – I've got three things here. Okay. I'd say the first one, which was comes kind of from my youth career – I hate calling it a career, but whatever. (laughs) I would say is like emphasizing the player role, the player accountability. Um, What does that mean? Because I think the the reality of the situation is most kids aren't going to play past a certain level or a certain age or even just like kind of matriculate on past club level. They're not going to play in college. But this is an opportunity to like teach them valuable skills. And I think when I was a kid, there were rules such as the kid, the player has to pack their own bag. So if, we, if you show up at a game and you've forgotten your socks, it's on you. It's can not we, on your parents. Can we name this team? Yeah. FC Richmond. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that rule, by the way. We never had that. And I sometimes had no socks. Yeah. And it was like, and like uh, basically the team had like 15 soccer balls in a big soccer bag rotated around which player got it the player who had it had to sh- show up making sure that they were pumped up and then like if they weren't then that player would pump them up and the team would run sprints until they were all pumped up so it teaches you like you That's better be accountable furious pumping yep it sure is <laughs> panicked pumping um, and then the other one that I will always remember is that the uh, director of SU Richmond was a guy named Dave Amsler who was very laconic not prone to uh, long monologues and had a very deep voice. I love that word. And uh, one of the rules was that if you were going to miss practice or a game, you had to call Dave directly and explain why. And if you can imagine saying, I have a homework to do. Mm-hmm. All right, power, I'll be at practice. Like, <laughs> power of silence. Yep. The power yep. of silence. And, but it really does teach you that like, you can't be like, mom, pack my bag and tell them I'm not going to be there. Like, it does sort of make you take responsibility for your actions. So we should send Dave's number to Nick Lawyer, and yeah. we should say that his club in Western Montana, every player that's going to miss practice or a game has to call Dave yeah. to explain why. Yeah. But the thing is, and like people might think that's harsh, and maybe it is, but for you me— You I'm joking, right? I do. I do. <laughs> but I want to—but, like, I imagine there are people out there who are like, that sounds so mean. That sounds so harsh. These are just 10-year-olds. But it bleeds into the team. That Then if you have this idea that, like, you're responsible for packing your bag— if you don't do the job you need to do, then your teammates suffer. Mm-hmm. If you like leave your teammates hanging by not showing up to practice, then that's one person down. That's one person that the coach was planning to be there that now the drill has to change. Yep. You let your team down. And so it kind of teaches you that you're part of a team and you've got to be there and be responsible for your actions to benefit the team. 
So these sound like you're also not just developing soccer skills and yeah. that kind of stuff, but you're developing people. Mm-hmm. So is that like I genuinely asking this? I think the answer is yes. But is that a realistic goal or realistic level of responsibility to put on a youth soccer team? I think so. Yeah. OK. I mean, like, I think within reason, like there are yeah, cer- yeah. certain times when it's like, yeah, they're 11, like right. a 10 year old. So there shouldn't be like um, an ethics class where you read all the philosophers. <laughs> Uh, no, no, and it's you know it's also like does a ten year old need to call Dave and be like my grandma died? <laughs> like, so Chidi from, from the good place won't be teaching a course in ethics in the middle no. of this. <laughs> no, I don't think soccer so. experience. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I think to stress early that like you have to be responsible for your actions. I yeah. think is a very good thing to teach a kid both for soccer reasons mm-hmm. and non soccer reasons. All right, so to put that like as a big picture thing, mm-hmm. then we're saying though like. Um, Coach the whole person. Uh, player right? accountability. Is player what I'm accountability. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, can I can I just sure. th- throw in some? Um, I've got a real simple one, which is one thing that sort of should be on best practices is keep it fun. Mm-hmm. Right. Keep it fun. If you're just constantly <laughs> it comes make- right on the heels of what I've said. But just, no. Yeah. But if you're just constantly making kids run sprints for tiny mm-hmm. little things that actually don't matter, like, and you think mm-hmm. you're teaching some lesson about discipline, what you're actually doing is just making soccer miserable. Yep. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, another one I've got is. Focus on improvement as a player, as a person, not necessarily on results. Mm-hmm. I know this is kind of an obvious one, but I think it's definitely worth having up there, right? Yeah. So just winning is not the most important thing. So if you win ugly or win by learning bad habits, like you know, long balls, strike and mm-hmm. knocks it down, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, uh, can I add one thing to yeah, your sprints absolutely. thing? Um, it sounds a little bit like uh, like a torture approach, but I'm cool with it. Is that like I've definitely played under coaches where it was the first 20 minutes of practice or fitness or the last 20 or the middle 20. And I think that is the worst idea because it just teaches you. To label you, it as fitness. It yeah. like teaches you that this is the bad bit. Yeah, like yeah. Oh, I'm going to hate the first 20 minutes of practice. I'm going to hate the last. Or like if you know that fitness is coming at the end, you're probably not going to work as hard because you need a yeah. little bit more left. You might, you might roll your ankle at the and, end of the scrimmage. Yeah. And so I think <laughs> you can stress like work really, really hard in this 7v7 drill and maybe we won't have fitness. Or you can say like just say like all right, everybody line up. We're going to like do this and do that. Like you don't need to say we're doing sprints now. Yeah. Like, that kind of has that impact. So you know like I've got some bad news. It's the fitness part yep. everyone have a big frown mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> that's it i did play for a coach who labeled the sprints as the name of the player who'd committed the infraction that Ooh. was always fun like grow up sprints how about um an approach to parents uh-huh. um, so from everything i've seen and heard and read do you want my approach to parents Shh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so mine wasn't complete silence but it was um i would say parents at games and at practice are only allowed to encourage yep you can't yell at your kid to do better you can't yell at like other kids for sucking and the team would win if that kid was taken out mm-hmm. and my kid was in yep. so basically only encouragement like well done timmy like that kind of stuff or go on could be that would be a very british thing but you know yeah. only, <laughs> only encouragement can be yelled at players or maybe it's easier because then you don't have to be the judge and jury in terms of what counts as encouragement and what counts as mm-hmm. not useful maybe just silence is good as well well yeah and i think there's also the element only of- applause how about that I mean, no, I think cheering is fine. I think yeah. cheering for your team. I think maybe not ever commenting on the other team because yes. there's definitely – I do not have children, but I imagine that I, if I did – I have a niece, for example. And if my niece went into like a shoulder-shoulder challenge with somebody and the other parent was like, she's a vicious player, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would probably respond to that. Mm-hmm. So I would say maybe keep the commentary about the other team to yourself. I would also say like kind of – You'd be like, take your kid home to watch Frozen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just know like my dad uh, famously would win like – he won an award for when my brother played lacrosse as like the parent who covered the most distance, not for driving, but because my dad paced throughout the entire game. That was just like he was. Can so... I assume that was an award that was made up that year? And oh yeah, not an award that was given out every year. Oh, it certainly was. It certainly was. <laughs> this is before Fitbit. And I'm fa- and I'm fairly confident that uh, if and when my wife and I have kids, and if and when they play sports, I will be that parent. Mm-hmm. And so I do think there is something to be said for like knowing when to try to help that. If Daryl Grove is my is my son, and Daryl Grove refuses to receive I mean, the ball, I'm your real son. Yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> if you receive refuse to receive the ball with your instep, like I might be like Daryl, instep, like use the inside of your foot. But I will never be like Daryl. Come wider, come wider. You've got to be wider because yeah, yeah. I don't know what the well, coach is trying the line, to do. Right? What if the coach was like not emphasizing instep? Like you might not be helping. That's true. So maybe sh- it's true. Yeah, see, there it is. Again, it's, it's tough to know. So maybe just leave it up to the coaches. Uh, FC Richmond also had the policy that parents weren't allowed to talk to the coach for Evan? that exact reason because then it's not like 
should my kid be doing this? Should he be doing that? Why isn't mm. he doing this? Why don't you give him more minutes? Why isn't he playing more? Yeah, can he play striker instead of defender? Oh, one final thing. What mm. about minutes? Is it like, I know that's, some clubs have point a policy. Two, actually. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're only on point two. Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. My point number two is uh, define your club's approach to player minutes. And I think that's important. Um, so if, everyone knows like where we're working from as opposed to... Yeah, yeah, because I think I've definitely coached in situations when it was everybody gets the same amount of minutes no matter what. I've coached in situations when it was... It's definitely a meritocracy. If they've worked really hard, if they've had a really good game, they stay in, and a kid gets fewer minutes as a result. And I think it's really important for your coaches to know which approach you want. Mm -hmm. Because if you are trying to have a, hey, we want everybody to be involved, keep it fun, keep everybody interested, and suddenly... One, like half the team is only playing five or ten minutes a game, yeah. which shouldn't be the case even if you are playing uneven minutes. But that's my point, is that you just don't want to be in a position where you're putting your coaches into a situation where they have to determine that. You right. want to tell them. But at the same time, you definitely don't ever want to be um, the kicking and screaming team from the Will Ferrell movie. The two? Yep. You just have the Italians. Mm-hmm. Pass to the Italians. Yeah. Right? You, you want to be more like the kicking, is it the Tigers team yes. from the second half of the season where you let Bucky play and, and yeah. everybody's all in. Right? Yeah, yeah. I guess that's that's a good point. Is I'm not saying like that should impact your tactics. It shouldn't mm-hmm. be like we always do this with these two players. Past and everybody the else. Yeah, <laughs> but I, but I I do think it's just an important because even for like because then that kind of informs what you're supposed to be doing as a coach. Are you training this team to be super competitive? Mm-hmm. Are you training this team to sort of like you know play as a team and be consistent? In which case you're maybe going to be less intense in practice than you would be otherwise. Okay. Any other any other uh, sort of principles? yeah. And then I think I think this we one should, is. We should on soon, but we yeah. should but this is one that i think i'll probably get some criticism for some of the points i've made oh, this one especially uh i'm gonna say it is important to me and it's important how you I, how you say this to parents but i'm gonna say establish a club identity in which results are important but not as important as development okay and it's really hard to do that because people hear that and they think results don't matter everybody gets a trophy this age we live in it's too easy to like go to mm-hmm. that right yeah. without realizing what the bigger goal of yeah. it is yeah. but, and what I would say is I have two examples go of to this. that criticism as well yeah, yeah. Uh, but I would say I, so I would phrase it like this like we won 7-0 isn't nearly as impressive to me as like we won two to one, but we did so by stringing together passes using triangles, and like the kids could identify that. Mm-hmm. If you win seven nil, you might be playing a bad team where you've got a big kid up front who can knock people over and score a goal. Doesn't mean that much, but if you're combining and possessing and finding ways to switch the point of attack, mm-hmm. that's really impressive. Like that Barcelona goal from the weekend. Have exactly. You seen that? Check yes. our Facebook page if you yeah. want to see that. It is incredible. And the other one I would say is like, I think sometimes clubs. Some clubs like to emphasize individual results. So, like, our U12s won this local tournament. And the reality, and thinking that that draws other kids to them, like, oh, they won that tournament, they won this tournament. Mm -hmm. And really, what's going to draw kids to you is six of the kids from that U12 team went on to play college soccer. And then it's, and so, like, if you keep kids involved, they'll draw kids and parents. Yeah. And so, I think that starts with the directors of, look, our goal is to develop players. It is not to, this guy can, this sweeper can kick the ball along to this, you know, tall for his age forward he'll settle and shoot and score that's what we're going to do if the directors are more so like we want everybody kind of like learning how to do this skill and this skill and play this way then i think that extends to the coaches and then that bleeds into the players approach all right so nick i hope you wrote all that down mm-hmm. it was long and i apologize <laughs> no it was good. i think it was really good and we got we got deep into that all right we have a similar um, next question how would i ask that one since i feel like i've talked a lot uh winston rivas says inspired Wait, hang on you just talked a lot so you're gonna talk some more well i'm gonna ask the question <laughs> assuming that you will then talk for longer than it takes for me to read the question should we track it and find out let's not do that winston rivas inspired by the top drawer soccer show i have taken it up to watch the youth league games here in portland Uh, I mostly go to non-development academy games, mostly Latino leagues with 13 to 17-year-olds where some of my students play because I work in a high school. Uh, When watching these games, what are some fundamental things I should look in regards to separating a good player uh, from a potentially great player? I think there must be a missing word there. What what should I look for in regards to separating a good player from a potentially great player? Um, So I I like this question. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I think it's really easy to go watch like a youth league and there's one kid that like dribbles past everyone because they're super fast yep. or they're sort of super confident and they, or they've got a really good shot or whatever. But I think when you're looking for, and I'm assuming the reason Winston is asking this is like, if I'm watching this, maybe I'll see someone who's a bit special and maybe I should tell someone like farther up the food chain about it, further up the food chain, mm-hmm. excuse me. Um, I think it's the off the ball stuff. And I say this, I'm not a scout, right? I don't necessarily have this experience. I think if you're watching 13 to 17 year olds and you're seeing, for example, a central midfielder who's always checking their shoulder when they don't have the ball. Yep. And then when they receive the ball, it's as if they already know what to do because they already know where everybody is and they've looked around. Mm. That's a special player because that's a person who 
understands the game in a way that the other players don't, right? Mm. Like that kid might not dribble past five people and score. Someone else might do that. But that player might sort of have, be looking around and be so aware of everything that he'll be in a position to yeah. receive the ball and move it on really quickly. And he's like the link to everything that you don't quite realize. Yeah. But if you've spotted him doing all that stuff, you'll know. What was the final part of this email originally? Was it something like like more than just the eye test? Yeah, so yeah, a little part I took out was um, instead of the old eye test. And because I, th- I think of the eye test as watching. So maybe I misunderstood the phrase. Well, it's more like, oh, he looks like a really good player. Like, oh, he's, I he, see. he yeah. keeps dribbling. Like, that's amazing. He's yeah, awesome. Yeah. So the eye test would be a player dribbling past five people and scoring. It would, but... But I think you could kind of flip it around and say, like, what you're talking about. Like, like you could look at a player who's continuously having – like, if you find yourself saying, like, that guy keeps, like, making really smart passes or he mm-hmm. keeps having a ton of space on the ball. If Like, maybe it's not an eye test, but that little thing that you kind of start to identify of, like, that guy always has time on the ball. Why does he always have time on the yeah, ball? Yeah. And that's the thing is, like, ask yourself why and then maybe look at what he's doing. So to your point, yeah, if he's, like, checking around, then that's why he keeps being able to adjust his positioning so he's always able to receive it in the, like, most – ideal spot yep and it's not to say that ideal is an absolute he receives it in, in an ideal spot and maybe like the kids i'm talking about who dribble and score mm-hmm. right they obviously if you're gonna make a youtube highlight video of that game probably that kid's gonna be on it right yep. and i'm not saying that that kid is bad at soccer they're obviously not right but i would say if you see that kid and that kid catches your attention then look what that kid is doing yeah. elsewhere in the game mm-hmm. to know if he's good or great yep. right if that kid is checking his shoulder and like cutting off passing angles for example mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff then you know oh he's not just like fast and dribbly and therefore like his athletic ability is getting him past people mm-hmm. um, he's got the, the soccer IQ the soccer smarts uh, to really make a difference so yep. the very broad answer is off the ball stuff yeah, yeah. I mean I, agreeing with that and then the other things I would just add on to that would be if it's a player who you kind of recognize isn't losing the ball like if they just and I don't mean that they like keep dribbling every single time and they never get it taken away but if it's a player who like oh like he's never been caught in possession oh he got out of that one again or oh like oh he never even came under pressure then again I think that that's a player who's putting him or herself in a position to not lose the ball which speaks volumes and I would also say players who are figuring things out is an incredibly important skill problem solvers Mm -hmm. yeah because like we, what's the definition of insanity? It's like doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. I feel mm-hmm. like that's not actually the definition, it's but it's the popularized one. Yeah. But that does happen a lot in sports. Uh, even like, I mean, definitely for me, I'll say that like in a game, it is really difficult to have that awareness to think I've tried to dribble past this guy four times and it hasn't worked. I should stop doing that. It tends to be that sort of natural instinct of, but I'll do it again and this time it will work. And to see the player who figures out like, oh, they're overloading this side. I'm never going to beat them. But if I cut the ball back and switch to the other side, there's an opportunity there. Yes. To see the player who can spot those things and adjust their game or to see a player who can think this player at the top of the box keeps getting an open shot. I'm going to make sure to slide across to screen and make sure I can block that off. Mm-hmm. That's the sort of development you want. If you see a kid who shows Arjen Robin to the outside and makes him dribble <laughs> down the right wing, then um, give that kid a contract. You're also in a weird league. <laughs> You're in one of those like, can 56 kids stop Arjen Robin? <laughs> The answer is still no. Probably so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have ooh, one more question. But first, I just want to have a little moment to say there's no ad on today's show, mm-hmm. but I want to thank everybody who has supported our advertisers um, over yes. the last couple of months. We've, every advertiser, we've had a great response, mm-hmm. and they've been like, I, you, we get better response from your show than many other shows because I assume because our listeners mm-hmm. are taking action on the ads that they hear. So I just want to say we're, we're winding down for the year, so there's no ads today, but I just want to say a real – Sincere thank you to mm-hmm. everyone who has supported our advertisers in the last couple of months. And thank you to everybody who listened to my cousin's podcast as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, should we let people know the final grade when he gets it? Sure. Yeah. All right. uh, we, do, we think the teacher has responded yes. to that Twitter stream, so that's interesting. <laughs> Could, when, do you know when he'll get the grade? I don't. All right. I don't well, know. I, I think it keeps going, but I imagine the semester is – I guess they don't do semesters in middle school, so it might be a year-long project. All right. We'll find out and we'll share it when it comes around. That works. All right. Uh, final question today, mm-hmm. Taylor, is from Craig Turner. Um, Craig wants to know, why is the term unplayable used to describe informed players like Mo Salah and Felipe Coutinho? Is this an English slash British thing? Growing up in New York, if you were deemed unplayable – you were probably the kid who was always struck out in kickball. Yep. Meaning you should not be played. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I was unplayable in uh, youth T-ball. I know that much. (laughs) Uh, In the British sense or the American sense? The American sense. Uh, (laughs) Definitely the American sense. I can confirm it has a British origin, but I was wondering if you might have a guess at what it is. This is one of those, like, Daryl's done the research slash has the local knowledge. What what does Taylor guess? So – in all honesty, I haven't really put a lot of thought into this one because I feel like there's probably an, a non-soccer slash football 
explanation for it, but I'm just going to say it's a player who's... Like, I mean, it is a player who's so good that they're seen as, like, you can't do anything against them. Yeah. And so... Like, there's no play you can make to stop them. Yeah. yeah. And so I would, I would guess that it's something like, you are not capable of play. Like, there's nothing that can be done to play against this player. It shortens to they're unplayable. But yes. I imagine it's something that, like... There's another element to me that wants to think it's like in snooker, a player who can never be beaten gets the title of unplayable. You're so close. Really? It is snooker related. Is it really? Yeah. I just randomly guessed the sport <laughs> that I don't know anything about. So before I give the... It's because I always pick on cricket. Before I give... It's also cricket related. If well, I also go. give the... Um, I'll give the explanation in a second, but does this? did this phrase strike you as weird? Or have you watched like, Premier watched, League soccer yeah. so long that it's yours? It's that, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's again, it's one of those... Uh, not meaning this in any way, like disparaging Craig, but like this is a question I would say is like my wife question, which is the thing where she would say, "Why do they say he's unplayable?" And I'd be like, "Well, but I have no idea. They just I have do. no idea. Yeah, yeah, it's just one of those things that like you hear all the time. Go back to your law homework. <laughs> it's, one, it's one of those things that you hear all the time, and so you just like it becomes part of your vernacular right up until somebody asks you why it is, and then you have no explanation for why. <laughs> so it is cricket and snooker. Mm-hmm. The reason being that um, in cricket and snooker, you can say both times that a ball is unplayable. Ah. So obviously, no, I'm not expecting everyone who's listening to understand snooker, but mm-hmm. so let's say pool is like a very close. Uh, uh, analogy, sure. yeah. uh, similar game. Imagine you, like, you've got it, you've got the white ball. You're going to strike it, and you're trying to hit the other ball, and that ball is essentially blocked off. Oh, there we you go. would say that that ball that you're trying to reach is unplayable. Like I cannot play my way to that ball. It's unplayable. Okay, right? Yeah. Um, and then with uh, cricket, obviously, let's go with another. It doesn't quite work because it doesn't quite match baseball. But if you're the batsman and the bowler's bowling the ball at you, so you're the mm-hmm. the batter and the pitcher is pitching the ball at you. Mm-hmm. Some bowlers will bowl the ball so fast or with so much spin that it is impossible to play a good shot from it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it, I guess it would work with a pitcher, right? If there's a pitcher who had just a he's, wicked, he's wicked un- spin. Unhittable. Unhittable, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's essentially unplayable means you can't make a play on the ball. Yeah. Right? The best you can do is like that makes block sense. it and yeah. defend yourself for one <laughs> for for that duration. Yeah. That makes okay. sense. Okay. Right. And that so because obviously cricket and snooker are kind of staple English sports, then that also the same terms get transported over to football. So therefore, Mohamed Salah is unplayable, which is a fact, by the way. Going, ba- <laughs> I, I'm just going, going back to Nick's question. Yeah, I feel like my answer is going to be your goal should be to develop to develop players that are unplayable without ever <laughs> saying that a player is unplayable. <laughs> that's 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 you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. no players ever like no you're not good enough to play, but uh, you want to establish players that are so good that no one can play against them. That's my that should be your goal as a soccer club. That should be the name of a club. <laughs> unplayable. Unplayable, unplayable. <laughs> Speaking of club names, this is off topic, but uh, we heard the Oh, and rumor? also stop saying unplayable as an adjective. Also that. <laughs> we heard the rumor today or was it somewhat confirmed that Nashville yeah. are getting an MLS expansion franchise. And you came into the office today and said, I heard the best suggestion for a Nashville name, and you wrote it on the I board. I think it's credit to Richard Hayes, uh, who uh, is the, I think, president of the Red Army here in Richmond. Oh, okay, As yeah. well as the, I think, the initial organizer of the American Outlaws uh-huh. chapter here in I Richmond. I call him Rich Hayes, but okay. Yeah, I mean, you, we're more formal, you know. <laughs> uh, but I think he found a list on Twitter of, like, the best names that he had seen, mm. one of which was the number 10 and then soccer club. Because uh-huh. you abbreviate that to 10SC, you say it faster and it becomes Tennessee. So Nashville 10SC? I think it might just be 10SC, but yeah, Nashville Tennessee would be a good one too. And then 10 obviously has a huge soccer sort of um, oh, tradition. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I didn't think about that because we don't mm-hmm. have enough numbers in, in major, major League Soccer, I think. So I like that one. I like that one a lot. Also, redemption for Jeff Ruta? Just yeah. saying, just mm-hmm. saying. <laughs> I, I think he's probably just saying, and if he's not, he should be. So thank you. Not even redemption, because he didn't need redeeming. I'd say uh, yeah, just, just... I don't know what's the word? Be. Just, uh, just you should victory. just like... Yeah, just not, not there knowing that you're correct. <laughs> thank you to Barry, Jonathan, Ethan, Nick, Winston, and Craig for today's questions. If you'd like to ask us a question, here's how you do it. You go to totalsoccershow.com slash questions there's a form you can fill out and it will sort of come to us in spreadsheet form which is where we keep all of our questions and yep. then we sort of pick out the ones we like and we answer them um, if you subscribe and support the total soccer show at ten dollars a month or more we guarantee to answer 
one per month. There's a box you can check that says, I am a $10 subscriber. We do check, so no cheating. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> and we guarantee to answer one per month. We do indeed. And if you subscribe at any level to the Total Soccer Show, we assign you a young, talented player oh, yeah. uh, for you to scout. So today's uh, scouting network. Mm-hmm. I have First, I have three updates on Americans yep. um, that we haven't received scouting reports about, but they're in the scouting network. Yep. And I want to get this news across that young Americans are doing things. Okay, Because that's part of it, right? We want to be able to keep track of young yes. Americans who are doing things as well as other players who are yeah, doing yeah. things. Yeah, much as it is to hear about talented young Germans, yeah. uh, it's also good to hear about uh, talented young Americans. Oh, yeah, they're in there today. So yeah. three quick updates on Americans. Um, Keaton Parks, the 20-year-old American midfielder at Benfica, made his league debut this weekend um, and got eight minutes in Benfica's 5-1 win over Tondela. How about that? Making him the new Freddie Adu? Uh, I think he's already Play, playing him. in Portugal. Yeah, um, Shaq Moore, 21-year-old American right back at Levante, signed a new contract with Levante. Thumbs up but was dropped from the match day squad this past weekend, and Levante will be loaning a right-back named Koke from Schalke as of January 1st. Thumbs down for Shaq Moore. I'm going to say those two things are probably not unrelated. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And last but by no means least, Eric Palmer-Brown, the 20-year-old centre-back, currently officially with Sporting KC, is moving to Man City in January. We kind of knew that, right? But when he does, uh, Metro US is reporting that he will then be loaned to PSV Eindhoven. I like that. So we'll have another American centre-back in the Eredivisie. I like that a lot. Yeah. Then we've got some actual scouting reports yes. from actual scouts. Uh, John Zaldanis scouting Declan Rice, 18-year-old Irish center back for West Ham. Declan Rice was subbed on for the injured Mark Noble in the 35th minute, 35th minute or fourth. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Are you uh, trying to book um, <laughs> book Ron's calendar? <laughs> What? He's taking appointments for run. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> May, 20, May 20th or something like that? Uh, yes, he, he subbed on for the injured Mark Noble in the 35th minute of the Hammers 3-0 away win <laughs> over Stoke on Saturday. That was a good reference, Daryl. Rice deputized well as he vocally organized the defense, still laughing, and took charge despite his youth. Depending on the severity of Noble's injury, uh, more may be required of Rice in the very near future. One weird thing to me is I thought Declan Rice was a centre-back, mm-hmm. which, yeah, he is listed as such in the report. Mark Mark Noble's a central midfielder. Interesting. So did he get a run out in midfield or did someone else get moved back? Or maybe somebody got moved well, up, I guess? Yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe he came in for a centre-back, that centre-back moved up, something okay. like that. Well, we'll find out. All right, Kirsten Mladinha is scouting Brill Embolo, is how I've been taught to pronounce it by the Bundesliga commentators. Okay. Um, the 20-year-old Swiss forward for Schalke. Oh, I know what Envelope did. Uh, Kirsten says, Finally, some good news about Brio Envelope. He's been getting consistent minutes, most as a sub, with Tedesco using him on the right wing as opposed to up top by himself. Envelope got his first start of the season against Gladbach and followed that up this past weekend with his first goal. He came on in the 68th minute with Schalke 2-0 down to Frankfurt. In the 82nd minute, he slid in at the back post to knock the ball home and was also involved in Schalke's last-minute equaliser as his pass deflected off of Frankfurt midfielder Marius Wolf to set up Naldo's shot. I saw this goal. Didn't Embolo do this thing where he did the Suarez thing where he kind of stood offside yep. but then aligned the himself goal, yeah. with the last defender? Yep. Yeah, well done, Brio. It was and very thank you, good. Kirsten. Yep. Uh, Steve Reinhardt scouting Yuri Tielemans, 20-year-old Belgian midfielder for AS Monaco. Steve has gone for a limerick this week was after going for a haiku, haiku previously. <laughs> there was a midfielder named Yuri who dreamed of Monaco glory, but something went wrong. His meniscus was torn. Post-surgery, we've nary a hear ye. Uh, in other words, says Steve, I've neither seen nor heard news of his condition post-surgery. Does I really appreciate that he found a way to like make no news on him into a more interesting <laughs> no, new, no news on him. I like that. Yeah. I would encourage more of that in the TSS Scatter Network, as long as it's nice and short. Like there it is. I was going to say, as the person who, who compiles <laughs> these, disagree. But Steve, good job. Beth Jolly and Alex Barone are scouting Kylian Mbappe, the 18-year-old striker. We know who he is, right? We don't have to just... That's why I left it off. Okay. Yeah. The 18-year-old striker, he turns 19 on Wednesday, finished a surprisingly high seventh in the Ballon d'Or voting. He also scored PSG's only goal in a 3-1 defeat to Bayern Munich in the Champions League, bringing his tally in that competition to 10 goals. He's the youngest person to reach that milestone by nearly two years. I think Karim Benzema previously was the youngest at 20 years of age. Lastly, he won the 2017 Telefoot Trophy for the best young French footballer and a scored in each of his last five games in all competitions. Can I add a bonus report to this? Sure. He hugged a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. He did. I missed that. Yeah. I saw saw that tweet and I was I saw that tweet too. I can't remember who sent the tweet. I'm sorry. If you sent us that tweet, thank you for sharing. But I assume 
Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle came on the field and Kenny Mbappe hugged him. Do you remember why that's important, though? No. Because that's what his teammates call him. They say he looks like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. I didn't I think, know that. Which okay. is not complimentary. Uh, and I think, <laughs> wait, wasn't that the story that, like, Tiago, I always get confused, Tiago Silva, I think, gave, the defender. gave him, like, a Dior headband or whatever to make him look like one of the turtles? <laughs> yes. So, that's, uh, I'm guessing that's why that happened. Got it. Dylan Veach, scouting Kai Havertz, 18-year-old German attacking midfielder for Bayer Leverkusen. Not Ka- going to lie, that's the exciting young German I was kind of referring to at the top of this category. Oh, I knew. Making oh, I all knew. young Americans except Christian Pulisic look bad. Well, Weston McKinney, he's okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kai started and played the full match today in Bayer's 4-4-3. Okay, yeah, you're right. Christian Pulisic <laughs> is the better one. In, play, in uh, Bayer's 4-4 thriller against Hanover, Kai played a position that I've yet to see him play. In what looked like a 3-4-3 in attack and a 4-2-3-1 in defense, he played as one of the two central midfielders and consistently played behind the attack, more of a deep-lying playmaker role. To keep an exciting game brief, Kai had one assist and one MLS assist. In the 46th minute, from just outside his own half, Kai, we're keeping it. It's an MLS assist no matter the league. Oh, yeah. From just outside his own half, Kai sent Leon Bailey through on goal, and he slotted it past the keeper to make it 3-3. 20 minutes later, from a handover corner, Kai picked out McMeddy, who found Bailey for his second goal. Once again, this kid is 18. He's playing all kinds of positions, and he's involved in all kinds of goals. Decent, is what I'll say. Oof. Okay, Wes Kaufman is scouting oh, young American Ayo Akinola, the 17-year-old American striker at Toronto FC. Wes says, the best team in MLS, no arguments here, signed up one of the best youth prospects in the league, no arguments here, on Monday, as Toronto FC inked Akinola to a homegrown player contract. You're not going to dispute the Monday? He becomes only the third player to progress from TFC's academy to TFC2 and now to the first team. Well done, Ayo. Yeah. Well done, TFC. I'm glad that the Canadian system is producing talented young Americans. Or at least three. Let's keep it that way. Uh, Patrick Keeler scouting Anthony Robinson, the 20-year-old American left back, all known at Bolton from Everton. Anthony again started and went the full 90 for Bolton in their disastrous 1-0 loss to Burton Albion. <laughs> Robinson generally played well and had nine clearances, one interception, and four tackles. Didn't he? I think I saw his report come in. Didn't he have like three or four successful dribbles? I believe so. Which I feel like is interesting because he's a left back and I've seen him dribble at people all the time mm-hmm. so he's kind of a winger playing left back yep he's kind of excited but I removed it because stats oh, you, do? <laughs> you have fewer stats yeah sorry I did it that back then <laughs> I'm, more like, I'm excited about Anthony Robertson because I want him to be called up by the yep. men's national team as well you should um, Kevin Downs is scouting Trevor Zwietslut I think is how he pronounced that 18 year old American defensive midfielder at Werder Bremen. This will be a new name to some TSS uh, listeners. Um, he's with the U19s at Werder Bremen. Um, Kevin says, Trevor had some eligibility issues, but then played in four straight games for the Bremen U19s, winning three and drawing one. However, he picked up an injury in early November and has been out since then. He was mentioned in a recent article in a local newspaper about Werder signing Josh Sargent in an effort to start an American pipeline in hopes of finding the next Pulisic or McKenney. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I get annoyed with my four-year-olds when they drift off while I'm, like, like trying to coach them. And it's, I have to remember moments like this when, heard everything you said, wrote this, my, like, like edited it down myself. Halfway through the scouting report, I was like, what is this, kid Dutch? And then I went back and I was like, oh, right. So you said American six times. My understanding is he does have a Dutch yeah. passport, which mm. may have been him sorting out his eligibility yeah. issues. Right? But I think it doesn't it was, mean he's going to play for the Netherlands, but yeah. he, he does have eligibility. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Um, I'm glad I'm on, on point with that one. Uh, Axel Romain scouting uh, Nathaniel Chalaba, 23-year-old English midfielder for Watford. Happy birthday, Nathaniel. He had his 23rd birthday on December 12th. But wasn't able to celebrate on the pitch since he's still out due to a knee injury he suffered in August. He has, however, been granted use of England's St. George's Park uh, facility to help him back to full fitness. So it seems he may still be in the plans for Southgate's World Cup team. He's definitely at least on the fringes because he's been caught up to a couple of squads, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Jay Glenn is scouting Ruben Neves, the 20-year-old Portuguese defensive midfielder for the for Wolverhampton Wanderers. Taylor's put for Wolverhampton Wolves FCSC. Yes, I did, just to annoy you. Are you Dave O'Brien? Yep. Um, all right, so Jay says, Ruben Neves has been incredibly solid in midfield for Wolves this year, but had only gotten one goal until this past weekend um, when he scored against Sheffield Wednesday to double his tally. In the 34th minute, a free kick from Ivan Cavallero was flicked back to the edge of the area by Willy Boley, where it found Neves, who perfectly placed his shot into the lower right corner. Wolves won the match 1-0 and remain top of the table. So we talked about this mm-hmm. briefly on the Thumbs Up, Thumbs Down weekend review show. We did. But you hadn't seen the goal at that point, right? I not. Do you remember me saying, I couldn't tell if it was side foot mm-hmm. or laces? And then I kind of made you watch this, I want to say a hundred times, until we had a decision. You made me watch it once, and then I think the certainty with which I answered and then immediately backtracked made me watch it 40 more times. <laughs> he was like, oh no, it's definitely in step. 
Okay, maybe it was laces. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you think it was laces in the end? I think because And why of, does that mean that he's probably going to win the Ballon d'Or with Wolves? I mean, first of all, he absolutely will. <laughs> but uh, he will not. <laughs> but it's because the way he hits it, uh, it's basically, uh, as, as the scouting report says, it's a free kick that's kind of been, it's that partial clearance where it's bouncing like about 25 yards out, and he's the one who's there more likely to kind of collect it and redistribute to keep play going. But in this situation, he hits it first time. And I think the way he hits it and the way it is so well placed, that tends to be sort of like he spots it and does like that in-step foot punch almost. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you could hear me kick my chair. (laughs) Uh, That like that, it tends to require that sort of like approach to the ball. Yeah. But then when you watch it again, I think you were correct that I think it is more likely laces, and it's just he manages to not follow through at all, so he keeps the ball low. Yeah. And then it's just kind of like by the time he lands, you can't quite tell that his ankle was locked because there's a little bit of blockage of the camera, but I think it probably is laces. I also think it wouldn't have traveled as fast as it did that's with true. the instep, yeah. and it possibly might have had a bit more bend on it. This yeah, ball is too point. straight, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, yep. mm-hmm. to, uh, to be instep. You're right, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, But great goal. If you can find it, please do. Yeah. yeah, because you really are right, though, because I think if the ball doesn't – bend and you score it's probably because you scored with your instep from like within four yards mm-hmm. but from 25 there's always going to be at least a little curl there's going to be an arc of some mm-hmm. sort right yep. okay so thank you to John Kirsten Steve Beth Alex Dylan Wes Patrick Kevin Axel and Jay for the scouting report. I can't believe we made it through that entire conversation discussing laces without making an Ace Ventura reference and I'm going to leave it at that okay I don't get that reference you have to explain it to me later that's upsetting alright oh do you mean like Lace Ventura no, I'm upset with you. I'm upset with you now. <laughs> I did make my own pun. It's time to end the show. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to join the TSS Scouting Network um, or get on the list for sort of guaranteed one question per month, go to totalsoccershow.com slash join. You will be supporting the show. And we thank everybody who has supported us so far. So if we, we have got to a point really where we're sort of really excited about how the show's going. It all started with the Scouting Network, right? Indeed. That was the first building block in us being able to do this more times per week, which is led to us being able to get advertised. It's kind of all built on top of the Scouting Network. Can't underscore or highlight enough how grateful we are for all the people who have supported us in that way. I agree. So the link to totalsoccershow.com slash join will be in the show notes. Beautiful. All right. We'll be back tomorrow, Taylor. We're going to do a sort of, I'm going to call it like a Christmas special maybe, the gifts yep. the gifts we would buy for people who need them, um, specifically soccer people. Yep. So thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening. We always appreciate it. And we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Laces out, Dan. Laces out, Dan.